Well, I think our first reading was long enough. Thank you, Nicholas, for that expert reading. So I am actually going to cut our second reading a little bit because I'm only going to deal with just the first two verses. So hear now the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O eternal God, we thank you for this witness from Luke's gospel, which we have just read. And for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who died and was raised, that we would receive new life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. Our rock, our strength, our hope, our love, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Last Sunday, we were all pretty sure we'd be safe from Ian, that we, that it would miss us. We were just barely in that southern part of the cone. Uh, We got home from church, unfortunately, and it started inching and inching closer to us, didn't it? Even on Tuesday morning, the staff uh, was here at church, and I felt pretty confident we were going to be okay, Uh, but by that afternoon, Kayla and I decided that it was too close of a call, Uh, we were going to get out of town. So we did. We evacuated. We packed up the car. Uh, We didn't want to take any chances with our four-month-old daughter, and uh, you know, babies need a lot of stuff. So it took us about an hour just to pack the car, uh, and it took us another four hours to cross the alley to head over to the East Coast, a drive that typically would take you less than two hours. Well, over the next few days from the safety of our hotel room, we watched in shock and dismay at the destruction Ian wrought on the southwest Florida coast. It was devastating to see places we know and love destroyed. Kayla and I like to get away uh, pretty much every year to Sanibel Captiva for a long weekend. So we were horrified to see the road there had been washed away, cutting off those places from the mainland. We saw the Naples Fire Department just uh, down the road on the national news Wednesday night. We It made us fear for the worst here at church. They had feet and feet of water in the fire station. But thankfully, no damage here at the church. When we got that report, it certainly felt like a miracle. Just one broken window, as Craig said, and and no water coming in to the church. Thanks be to God. Of course, we know other places weren't so lucky. Our prayers and our hearts go out to them. One of the churches in our presbytery, Chapel by the Sea, it's located on Fort Myers Beach. It's immediately across the road from the beach. You have the beach, the road, and Chapel by the Sea. And when I spoke with our general presbyter, Milana Scruggs, on Thursday, she said that initial reports were that the church was just completely gone washed away by the storm surge. Can you imagine? The Gulf is what brings so many people to our area. It helps to keep our temperature regulated throughout the year. It keeps us warmer in the winter, and you believe it or not, it keeps us cooler in the summer. It doesn't feel like it, but it does, I promise. It provides recreation activities at the beach or out on the boat. Its abundant seafood provides delicious fare for some, I don't partake, at uh, the many restaurants here in our area. 
this treasured part of God's creation that has lured so many to our shores, it has now become an instrument of devastation this week. And in light of all the damage our area has sustained, we read our passage a bit differently this morning, don't we? In the beginning of our text, in response to a command from the disciples, Jesus tells them that with just a little faith, they can do the impossible. But this impossible task that Jesus says they can do, it's it's a task of destruction. He tells them they can lift up this mulberry tree, uproot it from where it lives, and move it and plant it into the sea. I wonder why Jesus chose that particular image. In Matthew and Mark's gospel, we hear about moving mountains with our faith. That's an image we're more familiar with, perhaps. Matthew says we can move mountains and toss them into the sea. But Luke, he uses this agricultural reference, a mulberry tree. It would have been known to the disciples that these trees have extraordinarily deep roots. Their root systems make it nearly impossible for them to move. But even if you could, even if you had the will and the strength to do it, why? Why would you do that? Why would you have this moment of destruction? Well, in contrast for us this morning, we didn't uproot trees with our faith. Instead, it was the sea who uprooted trees, cars, boats, homes, and lives. Instead of the tree being planted in the sea, the sea uprooted the tree. Well, perhaps this isn't the only reversal from our story this morning. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Because as Nancy said, today is World Communion Sunday. I knew there was something in the announcements I forgot to mention. It is World Communion Sunday, and as Nancy and Audrey shared with us, it comes from our own Presbyterian tradition, a gift to the ecumenical community. First celebrated at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in the early 30s. We had exciting plans to have breads available from all over the world. Bryce was going to play music from various nations we've had to scale back due to the storm. And it seems rather odd to have a global focus this Sunday when something so tragic locally has happened, but perhaps it can make a bit of sense. After all, the U.S. wasn't the only nation affected by Ian. Before it reached us, it devastated the island of Cuba, a country still reeling from a major fire disaster just a few months ago. It affected other Caribbean islands as well. None of these places have the ability and resources to rebuild the way that we do. And so we need to remember them in our prayers as well. But my experience this week, it's made me think a bit more about Walker Percy's theory of hurricanes that Craig mentioned last week. Frankly, it made me question how serious of a hurricane Walker Percy had ever experienced personally. Because I must say, I haven't felt good this week. Having to leave my home, worry about damage to it, damage to this place, our church, home, that hasn't felt good. His main point is that hurricanes jolt us out of the malaise of our everyday lives, and that's certainly true, but I must say I prefer the malaise of everyday life to what we've had this past week. Give me any normal Wednesday versus the Wednesday we've just had. And I've been extremely fortunate compared to most people. The worst that's happened to me is that Mary, my daughter, has picked a very bad week to get her first cold. She hasn't slept much, which means I haven't slept much. Perhaps if Walker Percy had to take care of a sick infant after a hurricane, 
he would have come up with a different theory of hurricanes, but who knows? But while I haven't felt good this past week, what I have felt is gratitude. Gratitude for a lot of things. I'm grateful for cooler weather, when so many of us have been without power. I'm grateful for line workers who have come from all over the country, descending upon our state to work around the clock to restore power. I'm grateful for friends and family checking in with each other before, during, after the storm. People checking in with each other to make sure they're safe, to make sure they have the provisions that they need. It's been great to share excitedly when we get power back, and we mourn with those who are still waiting for the lights to come on and the AC to start running. And as we mentioned in the announcements, we'll do that a bit more in Spencer Hall following the service. I hope you'll join us for that. Well, this hurricane has also been a reminder of the many things we take for granted here in the States, hasn't it? On a normal day, we turn the tap and water comes streaming out, clean drinking water. We flip a switch and our rooms are filled with light. We have endless entertainment at our fingertips from our remote controls or our computers and devices. For much of our siblings around the world with whom we're celebrating communion today, that's simply not the case for them. The frustration we've felt around not having electricity, difficulty sending texts and phone calls being received, boil water notices due to unclean drinking water, For so many people around the globe, this is simply called everyday life. It's their reality. So I'm grateful, even amidst the storm, to live in a place of such plenty and abundance. But getting back to our text, the apostles, they plead with Jesus, asking him, Increase our faith, Lord. Jesus' response, it seems to be quite harsh, at least in the English. Uh, Jesus, he appears to question the very existence of their faith. He says, if you had faith, if, can you imagine? The disciples, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus says, if you had any. Well, Fred Craddock, a preaching and New Testament professor in his commentary on Luke's gospel, he provides us with a bit more context. You see, in the original Greek, it is clear that Jesus' response is not questioning their faith, but rather it's implied that he is recognizing their faith. It's a nuance that gets lost in translation. And this is what Dr. Craddock writes. He says, Jesus' response is not a reprimand for the absence of faith, but rather it's an affirmation of the faith they have, and this is the part that I love, it's an invitation to live out the full possibilities of that faith. And that's where I want us to end this morning, an invitation to live out the full possibilities of our faith. For Jesus tells us if we have the faith of a mustard seed, and we do, we do, then we can move mountains. We can uproot mulberry trees. But for us today, instead of using a destructive metaphor, let us consider how our faith can lead us to be constructive, how we can reconstruct our lives and those in our community. Jesus reassures us that even our most meager faith gives us the strength to do the seemingly impossible. Hurricane Ian pushed the sea up onto our shore, uprooting people's homes and lives. But Jesus tells us our faith has an equal amount of force and perhaps even greater than Ian. 
How will we use that force? How can we help people rebuild? What does that look like in the days and weeks ahead? In the aftermath of Hurricane Irma a few years ago, a need became clear. The storm exposed a lack of safe, affordable, and hurricane-resistant housing in Immokalee. Out of that tragedy, that destruction, came a bold idea, a big dream. And the Immokalee Fair Housing Alliance was born. At the beginning, it seemed like an impossibility. There are so few landlords in Immokalee who have an iron grip on rent and land. There were too many obstacles for it to work. It seemed impossible. But by faith and through the grace of God, that housing is now being built. The dream is becoming a reality. And our church community is playing a big part in making that happen. So what will come of the events of this week? How will we respond? What will we do? I, I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know that God is at work among us. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah saying, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So let us discern together what God is calling us to do. How we might use our faith to match the destruction of Ian with an even greater force of reconstruction, of rebuilding lives, rebuilding homes in new and better ways. To again quote Isaiah, let us be repairers of the breach, restorers of streets to live on. May it be so this day and in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks be to God. Amen.